Hello, and welcome to our Behind the Book series brought to you by the Library of Congress. My name is Marie Arana, and I'm the literary director here at the Library of Congress. In this new series, we'll be taking you on a behind the scenes journey through the fascinating, high stakes, high visibility, yet often mystifying world of American book publishing. What goes on behind every book? How does it go from an author's imagination to that coveted place on your bookshelf? How do bestsellers or literary masterpieces get made and designed and publicized and marketed and sold? Who are the people who make that happen? Well, we intend to give you a peek behind the curtain and show you how the process works. As we go, we'll be introducing you to the unsung heroes, unsung to the general public, but celebrated within the industry and the writing profession who do this vital work. In this particular program, we focus on one of publishing's great American editors, those talented visionary individuals who take a book from idea to finished work. They need to be big picture visionaries on the one hand, but demanding and precise on the other. They need to be tough on the page and the negotiating table, yet kind and inspiring to their authors. They're the first stop in the process, the gatekeepers who see a work in its rawest form recognize the talent, negotiate the contract, and then guide a book through all the rest. You've certainly come to the right place to learn about this career because our great American editor today is the legendary Nan Talese. Talese is a senior vice president of Doubleday. Since 1990, she has been the publisher and editorial director of her own imprint, Nan A. Talese Books, known for publishing such notable authors as Pat Conroy, Ian McEwen, and Peter Ackroyd. And of course, the hugely popular phenomenon, Margaret Atwood. Nan was born Nan Ahern in Rye, New York. Her father was a banker. Her mother hailed from an old Houston family. She grew up largely in Connecticut, graduated from Manhattanville College, got a job as an accessories editor at Vogue magazine, and met and married writer-reporter Gay Talese, one of the early practitioners of the new journalism, author of many bestsellers himself, including The Kingdom and the Power, Honor Thy Father, and Thy Neighbor's Wife. Nan and Gay's parties in their Upper East Side New York apartment became renowned for the glittering literati who attended them, Allen Ginsberg and many, many others. Nan's wide-ranging tastes from literary fiction to biography, to history, and narrative nonfiction have shaped American reading habits over the past five decades. Known for her keen eye and discerning editorial notes, Nan has made an indelible impression on the world of publishing since 1959, when she joined Random House as a proofreader. She was later promoted to literary editor, the first woman to hold that position in a largely male world, working with such writers as A.E. Hotchner on his international bestseller, Papa Hemingway, and Robert Penn Warren's novels, Flood and Wilderness. Nan went on to have renowned stints at Simon & Schuster, where she edited Schindler's List by Thomas Keneally, and at Houghton Mifflin, where she acquired The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood, and The Prince of Tides by Pat Conroy. Wherever she went, she took her authors with her. That stellar list is far more than I can mention here, but it includes Antonia Fraser, Thomas Cahill, Jennifer Egan. Her books have been nominated for many prestigious awards, including the Booker Prize, the National Book Award, and the Pulitzer Prize. In the past year alone, Margaret Atwood's The Testaments, which Nan published, won the 2019 Booker Prize. Alex Kotlowitz's An American Summer won the 2020 J. Anthony Lucas Book Prize. Joining Nan today in our program is her author and dear friend of 50 years, Margaret Atwood. Margaret really needs no introduction for me. Her works, more than 50 books of poetry and fiction and critical essays and graphic novels are known for their uncanny ability to tap into the real world mindset. In addition to The Handmaid's Tale, now an award-winning TV series, her novels include Cat's Eye, Alias Grace, 
The Blind Assassin, Oryx and Crake, Mad Adam, and most recently her sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, The Testaments. We are truly fortunate to have Margaret Atwood join us in this tribute to Nantalise's remarkable editorial career. It's such a delight to welcome you to the Library of Congress, Nan Talese and Margaret, Thank you. Margaret Atwood, both of you, just absolutely thrilling to have you here. Can you tell us where you're speaking from? Nan, where are you? I'm in New York City. Uh, wonderful. Margaret, where are you? I'm in Toronto City. <laughs> <laughs> terrific, terrific. Well, great to have you here uh, virtually with us at the Library of Congress. Nan, I want to start by saluting you for the work you've done as one of the great American editors of the past century. On behalf of the Library of Congress, thank you for your long, remarkably productive and trailblazing career. You've given us many wonderful books in the past 60 years. You've paved a path for generations of women who followed in your footsteps. And it seems we've caught you at just the perfect time because at the end of this month, December, 2020, you're going to hang up your proverbial spurs right. and, and begin a well-deserved retirement, right? Yes. <laughs> well, wonderful. Well, congratulations. And we're, we're really, you. really happy to be sending up these candles and these fireworks for you here at the Library of Congress. Well, I'm delighted to do it. I think the Library of Congress is wonderful. And I must say, I'm very awed by um, the fact that you've chosen me to be one of the editors. Well, uh, and well chosen, I would say. Margaret, thank you for joining us for this. I don't, I don't think there's anyone who has a better perspective on Nan's editorial personality and her career. Uh, would you give us a little cameo on how that friendship and working relationship began? Yes. Yeah, so uh, it began because Nan moved to Simon & Schuster, and I had published one book there with a man called Dan Green, who was actually head of publicity, but he wanted to have a little uh, side caper as an editor. And he acquired Surfacing, which he at first promoted as a hunting and fishing tale, um, <laughs> thereby annoying a lot of men and turning off a lot of women. Uh, but then when they figured out what it was actually about, uh, it acquired its second audience. And then Nan came into the picture for Lady Oracle and was my editor at Simon & Schuster until she vamosed to Houghton Mifflin, ultimately dragging me along with her to Houghton Mifflin. And then she skibbity hopped over to Doubleday and uh, dragged me along there too, and and here we and then she became Nantalie's her own imprint, and uh, so we've had a number of incarnations. And I thought I would read you a piece that I wrote in two thousand and five when Nan was given the first Maxwell Perkins Award um, for uh, being a super editor. Maxwell Perkins was one of those, as you know, so that's why the award is named after him. So this was 2005. How fitting it is that Nantalise should be the first ever recipient of the Maxwell E. Perkins Award, named for such a towering giant of an American editor. Nan would not wish to be called a giantess. It would offend her sense of what, a, what is proper in a lady and make her worry about her figure, which has always been enviable. But let us just say that she looms very large, as it is fine to loom large without actually being so. I first met Nan in the mid-1970s when she became my editor at Simon & Schuster. She looked like a 1920s flapper then, bearing an uncanny resemblance to Coco Chanel, a book on whom she would later publish, and she still looks like one, though Nan does not, in fact, flap. She is one of the most unflappable people I know, preserving her serenity through crisis after publishing crisis. Like Dylan Thomas's aunt in A Child's Christmas in Wales, she is known for saying the right thing always. The New York publishing world is filled with Walter Raleigh's who would gladly lay their cloaks across mud puddles for Nan to step on, except that she doesn't need to step on cloak. She merely 
jumps across the puddles while pretending they aren't actually there. After we'd shared some publishing adventures at Simon & Schuster, Nan departed for Houghton Mifflin in the early 18, 1980s, <laughs> say 1880s. No, it feels that long, does it? <laughs> Not that long ago. Since <laughs> she made an ambush-like blind offer on my risky novel, The Handmaid's Tale, bidding on it sight unseen, and thus made publishing history. That item just keeps on going in many forms. It's been a film and an opera and a ballet, and is now a television series. Despite her Miss Manners capabilities, Nan, like all noteworthy publishers and editors, is a risk taker at heart, indeed a gambler, and she has certainly gambled on me, for which I am duly grateful. Shortly after the publication of The Handmaid's Tale, Nan leapt over to Doubleday, which at that moment was in a rather shoddy condition. Why are you doing this terrible thing? I asked her, dismayed. I like a challenge, was her reply. I'll begin with the covers. There must be beautiful covers. New broom in hand, she began busily sweeping and redecorating, helping to form the thing of splendor you now see before you. Needless to say, I followed her to the new address, hoping for the best, a hope in which I have not been disappointed. Through all these changes of abode, Nan has kept the editorial face, faith. In the publishing world in which bean counter and bottom line have become powerful determinants, dictating which book shall see the light of day and which not, Nan has stood witness to the fact that in literature, there are more things to be counted than beans and more lines to be taken into consideration than the bottom one. Lines of prose, for instance. Her list has been noteworthy for its commitment to literary excellence. I expect she has a secret wall where she pins up the many notices of awards her authors have won, just as steeplechase riders pin up their rosettes. I sometimes think of Nan as a daring Troika driver, dashing through the snow just ahead of the wolves, with her authors piled on precariously behind. It's been an exhilarating ride, though with here and there a scream-worthy moment, as Nan has veered unexpectedly and dangerously around the corner. At more tranquil times, I remember with fondness a favorite saying of Nan's, rise above it, a phrase I inserted into my novel, The Blind Assassin, as a hidden tribute to her. Whatever the it may have been, Nan has indeed risen above it. She's way up there. Dear Nan, congratulations. Thank you, Peggy, so much. But, uh, you know, the amazing thing is that this belongs to the authors, not to editors. I mean, to publish authors such as Peggy, uh, Margaret Atwood, who writes so beautifully, is no trick. I mean, it just says, take me. And... Um, it's been wonderful to have her on my list all the time. And she's brought to me some wonderful writers, including Valerie Martin. And, you know, it's just, she's just been a joy to work with. Well, there are stories, Nan, of you shutting yourself up for six weeks with 2,000 pages of somebody else's manuscript. <laughs> coming out of it with, you know, manageable 500 pages. <laughs> so you have done those things. That was yes, I did one. that. That was, um, you're talking about Pat Conroy when yeah. Pat Conroy came to me and he <clears throat> gave me a 1500 page, um, a 1500 page manuscript, which I read. And then the editing I did in terms of cutting and shuffling things around, I eventually put on six pieces of yellow piece of paper. And I, those papers, I understand, are now uh, resting in the pa in South Carolina, in uh, a building named for Pat. So that's very pleasing. Yeah. Well, I, re I remember that Pat actually said, "I hand Nan the manuscript, and she finds the book in it." That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I always thought that was charming. <laughs> 
But he's the only one has, who I think has ever done that. I mean, to such an extent. Well, to such an extent, yes, but others have done it. Um, so yes, let us go back to the origins of all this, Nan, uh, dialing back through time and to the moment where whatever put it into your head that you were going to be an editor because this was kind of a boy game at the time. Um, it was because I had just graduated from college and I was in Vogue magazine. And I think I had just been married to Gay Talese, the writer, or um, <clears throat> we were intending to get married. And an editor from, uh, Gay was at that time at the New York Times, uh, an editor from Random House uh, approached him about reading a book and asked if he would come in, uh, he would come into the office. And he said, you know, let me uh, have Nan take my place because she reads all the time. Much, it's much better that you have her than me. <laughs> so I went in to... Uh, take the meeting, which I did, and I met Albert Erskine, the editor-in-chief, and he handed me a piece of paper and said, find the errors in it. And so, and, and at one point he turned to me and said, you know, you can use the dictionary. So I corrected it and gave it back to him, and I was hired on, on the spot. Mm, well, and, you must have been well-trained by the nuns. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It was just reading all the time. I always read. And happily, most of the writers I read uh, were very good. So I picked up good habits from them. So, so then they hired you as what? They hired me as a copy editor. Yeah. And I remember I worked on all of Joe Fox's uh, books. He was a a very, very admired editor at that time. Philip Roth and Truman Capote were his authors, and there were some others as well. But uh, in copy editing, sometimes I would actually edit them and talk to Joe about it and say, I think we should, the, the uh, this follows chapter seven and et cetera, et cetera. So then so they eventually made me an editor. So this was at um, Random House. To All of it was at Random House. Yeah. So did they have air conditioning yet? I can't remember. Yeah, I think <laughs> you did. Wait. So this is in the in the late fifties or early sixties? No, it must be the middle sixties because I graduated from college and then went to Vogue. No, I think it was probably in the beginning of the sixties. Oh. Yeah, you can usually figure out by dialing back to your wardrobe at the time. <laughs> so there weren't any miniskirts yet, right? I guess not. I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> but Margaret says a very, a very uh, important and good thing, which is that it was really a, a boys' game, right? It was uh, all, all the editors were male. Entirely. It was entirely, and the fact that they hired me as an editor was sort of. Uh, extraordinary because there weren't any w women editors at that time, or certainly not at Random House. Well, or if we're there sure. were, they did children's books or cookbooks, and that was all. Well, and I wanted to do literary fiction and nonfiction, mm -hmm. so I did. So you went to Simon and Chester. Did they headhunt you and offer you a job as a real editor? They offered me a job as a senior editor, um, so I must have been. Had you have been a junior editor already at Random House. No, I th but I think Random House had already uh, promoted me to senior yeah. editor. Okay. And anyway, then I went to Simon and Schuster, and that's where you and I began as a team. That's right. Yeah, it was first. It was Dan, and my funny story about Dan Green is that he was afraid of leaving uh, New York because he thought that if he left New York, he'd never be able to get back to it. And I talked him into going to a a conference in Montreal, at which point he, he lost his passport. <laughs> More his fears oh. and realizes, am I going to have to stay here forever? I'll never be able to get back to New York. Oh, <laughs> funny, funny. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing, one thing um, you know, when you went to Simon & Schuster, though, Nan, you already had a very large feather in your cap, right? Because you had published Papa Hemingway. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you had, I, blow, you had blown all those boys out of the water. You had blown all those boys out of the water with that book. Uh, you had defended um, a court case, right? You had you had to step yeah. up and say that uh, that uh, Mary, Mary, Mary anyway couldn't stop you, right. couldn't stop you. So um, you had you had a bit of fame before you actually uh, went to Simon and Schuster and, and ganged up with Margaret ganged up. I'm not sure that we would put it exactly. <laughs> but I, I mean, I think key to all publishing and therefore to editors is good writing. And even though the book, second book of hers that I published was a very different sort of book, it was still, this was a uh, handmade still, it was still a wonderful book. And I think that that is this thing that's marvelous about publishing, or at least it was at, at the time that I was there. Yeah, Margaret, I want to ask you about, um, because you had been pu publishing poetry, and in fact, you, the, your current book uh, is a wonderful book called Dearly, and it's a, a wonderful collection of poetry, but you had been publishing poetry, and then you had gone into with surfacing, right, into the fictional form. Do no. I have that right? No? No, no, it's, it's, it's a it's the following story. Okay, in Canada in the six in the fifties and sixties, it was almost impossible to publish a novel. It was very hard uh, because the few publishers that existed at that time um, either didn't publish novels like Oxford Uni University Press, or they they would, but they would have to have a U.S. publisher and 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 or an English publisher because they thought that the audience wasn't. Well, big enough for novels in Canada in, at that time to justify the expense. So my first novel was called The Edible Woman, and the publisher was Canadian who made a deal with Andre Deutsch in England and with Peter Davison of Atlantic Monthly Press in the state. So it was published in all those three countries, but not yet with Nan um, because she was at... Um, Random House or Simon and Schuster at the time. So that was the first novel, but I had been writing novels all along. It's just that I hadn't been publishing Publicing them. Mm. Uh, I've been writing short stories. I've been writing novels. Edible Woman is actually my second finished novel. The first one, Praise the Lord, didn't get published. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fate. <laughs> it was promising. What can I say? Um, What's your impression of Nat when you met her? Um, what was your your sense of her? I know you've 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 referred to her as being um, this with her trademark pearls and her white beret. And can you can you? <laughs> well, she was always very stylish, um, and her story is that that she got that from her mother, so her mother would have been actually a flapper. So she did have the trademark pearls and the white beret, and um, I think she still got them. So, yes. The pearls I certainly wear a lot, and I, I now have uh, berets in various colors, all of which come from Canada. Where in Canada did they come from? I get it through the internet. So we don't actually know who's making those berets. <laughs> <laughs> all we do not know. Anyway, they always look good now. I, I like them. They're very comfortable, and it doesn't matter how hard the wind blows, they do not come off. I love, I love that metal image. I, I also love that image of you um, in that wonderful photograph by Eric Bowman, I think it is, who you're lying on a sofa in your office, and you're looking as if work takes absolutely no effort at all. <laughs> we can see the pearls, and there's there's no beret, I, I don't think, but your desk is behind you, and it's bristling with pencils, and there are manuscripts in front of you with uh, handwritten notes, and uh, and just behind you are these two loyal companions of yours, your, your dogs, and you make editing look like a charmed life, Nan. Well, it is in a way. <laughs> it really is a charmed life. I mean, there uh, I was being paid to read, which I would have done anyway. And I, you know, and I've discovered some wonderful authors. One thing I have to tell you about Simon & Schuster, there was uh, an author, Thomas Keneally, mm -hmm. whose 
Australian mm -hmm. who uh, had done a number of books. And I thought I had read them and uh, I thought he was very good. And he said, I've been in this leather store in California and saw this file that this man keeps. And it's all about the people that a man called Schindler um, uh, saved. Yeah. He saved their lives. And I very much wanted to do it. And I said, would you put it in for uh, as a proposal? And so he did. And uh, I brought it to the president of the company, um, Dick Snyder. And Dick didn't want to do it. But I kept after him. I sort of wore him down, I think. And from that moment on, I published Thomas Keneally. Mm -hmm. Why didn't Dick want to do it? I don't know. I, I, I don't. Don't I, I think probably because he didn't think it was very commercial. Mm. But um, mm. it turned out to be a huge success. And of course, the movie was a wonderful success. Um, anyway, why should one be paid for that? <laughs> How, can, you, can you characterize the difference for us, Nan, between Random House in, in terms of the character of the place and Simon and Schuster? Was there or was, was there a difference? Uh, there I, was a difference in a way because at Random House, people never spoke directly; everything was sort of indirect. And uh, Alice Mayhew was. Uh, a colleague of mine, and she had left Random House to go to Simon and Schuster, and she said to me, "I really should should come to Simon and Schuster because people talk very directly about what they mean instead of going around the bush." So I went over and talked to an editor, and I went to Simon and Schuster. And and were you happy about that? Uh, <clears throat> not terribly, because I had to fight as I did. I just told you. Story of Thomas Keneally, I had to argue for a number of number of my books, and um, anyway, it was there that I got in great trouble with Oprah, because I published a million pieces, which I was told I should publish as a novel, and I said no. I think that the book I said this was a, my conversation with the author should be published as nonfiction because James writes about the experience of being an addict. And so we published it as a nonfiction book and Oprah got very upset about a couple of things. I had to defend James Fry, who was terrific. He's gone on to other places, but, um, I think it was just a question. I mean, I really thought that the book made the reader feel. Yeah, and, and it, what you're saying, Nan, reminds me of something that Ian McEwen said about you, and that is that you are a tigress for your authors. And I can I can see you defending uh, James Fry. And I, I remember very well the brouhaha around that book. But you are somebody who, as, as, as McEwen says, um, really not only you know, works on the on the manuscript and whips it into shape or digs that book out of the manuscript, as Pat Conroy says, but also, uh, you know, in in the heat of things, when uh, authors are taking heat, you're there defending as well. So that's, uh, that's, that's very rare. Yes, I remember there was a meeting, all the editors and the publisher, and uh, they said that they would never do what I did. And they thought it was sort of shocking having having portrayed something as <clears throat> nonfiction when indeed it was just adjusted. So we published it as nonfiction. Can you tell us a little bit, um, Nan and Margaret, about your relationship and how you how you work and what what are the characteristics of that relationship and how does that dynamic work between you? Well, a couple of a couple of anecdotes. Do you remember the time when we stayed at your house, Nan? Uh huh. Graham, I, I made Graham sleep in the bathtub um, because we had a, a small baby. A new baby. You had a new baby, and he was having a mig migraine headache, and he was groaning a lot. So I thought, all right, you're going to have to sleep in the bathroom because otherwise you're going to wake up the baby. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> you didn't know that. It was yeah. your bathtub. 
Uh, and the other thing we used to do, well, there was that other time. Remember the ice storm, Nan? I guess so, yes. Okay, so it was, it was remember the Santa Monica earthquake? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I was supposed to go to New York, be on the Charlie Rose show, and then fly to um, California and go to Santa Barbara via Los Angeles. So as I was going down the runway to get on the plane for New York, there was a TV and they were having an earthquake in, in Los Angeles. And I thought, oh, oh, <laughs> maybe I'm not going to be able to go. So I get to New York. I do the Charlie Rose show and they start having an ice storm. Remember that? Yes. And, and me and Marley Rusoff ended up having a pajama party in your house. I remember that. Remember that? I wasn't supposed to be. I was supposed to be on a plane, but of course they'd all been canceled and we couldn't phone anybody. All the phones were down. So we had a PJ party at your house and I decided to chance it through San Francisco the next day. And Marley in her dressing gown and slippers ran across the road to a hotel. He got a taxi. Oh, <laughs> and, uh, I didn't know about that part. That, you, well, well, it's very funny. And I got into the taxi from your house, and it turned out that that was the first day he'd ever driven a taxi. <laughs> the story goes on from there. I did eventually make it. Uh, so that's another adventure I had at your house. And the other thing we used to do, you and um, Phoebe, my agent, and Vivian, my other agent, and sometimes um, people from England would come and we would We'd all have um, we'd all have dinner or breakfast. We'd have something to eat, uh, <laughs> and I would give each of you a, a bag, and inside the bag would be the manuscript, and it would be appropriately wrapped in a color uh, to go with your personality. My blue ribbon. Yes, you got blue, um, and uh, <laughs> Vivian always got purple. Um, Phoebe got mauve. So then you would all go off and you would have about 48 hours to read the manuscript. And then we'd all get back together and you would have your notes. Remember that? Yes, I do. And it was at the Winston um, Arms Hotel, which was somewhat falling down. And um, the Windsor Arms, sorry. And you had a chaise long in your room. And that's what you liked about it because you liked to lie down to read books. <laughs> with my knees up. That's right. So we did that for a while until um, until we didn't do it anymore. Well, well it sounds well, like a lot of uh, you do too had a lot of fun. Nan, I'm sorry to inter interrupt. Please go. Uh, no, it's true because the editor in Canada, Louise Dennis, has been her editor as long as I've been. Mm. So, uh, it was Ellen Seligman before. Yes. Remember, right. Urban, she unfortunately died. But Louise has been around, certainly. But it was really, it was terrific because we were all a team and it was all for Margaret, for Peggy. You you two make the author-editor uh, the author -editor relationship sound like a lot of fun. I'm sure it's not a lot of fun all the time, Nan. Um, are there, you know, the, is there? A well, I mean, there are times that, I suggest something to the author and the author won't do it. And, you know, it's there that I remember um, <clears throat> at, this is when I was at, I must've been uh, when I was at uh, Doubleday and Ian sent me a manuscript and unlike his previous manuscripts, he really had to do some work. So uh, I sent him I think it was a six-page letter asking him if he would do X, Y, and Z. And uh, so he went back to the manuscript. And I remember Sonny Maida, who was then the uh, publisher, coming into my office and saying, and he had published Ian when he was in England, and saying, uh, well, I see Ian took all your suggestions. That's the only time I really thought I had uh, lost an author by suggesting, by making suggestions. Well, was he annoyed to begin with? I don't know. He was in London and I was here. <laughs> Did he write you a sniffy letter? No. No. 
Well, he well, just went back to the manuscript. You weren't going to lose him then. So did he take your advice? Uh, yes, he answered. He, he, <laughs> I can't remember, but I think he did. If if uh, Sonny had said, I see he took all your suggestions. But uh, Ian is an author that came to me because I came went to him. I had heard about him, and I he sounded like he was exactly the sort of author I should publish. And um, so I was invited to go down to the I was Writer Workshop, which is where he was at that point, uh, because Jack Leggett, who was an author, and also he had published Gay at Harper's, um, thought I should go down and read the manuscript. And I remember reading the manuscript and then walking uh, across along the banks of, of the river. And at first, my heart just fell because it was very, the plot was very much like um, a book I had just published. And, but the writing was so wonderful. And uh, so I published it and that was The Cement Garden. And then I published him from then on. And once uh, it, we were gonna do a contract f with him for his next book. And I said, what is the title? And Ian said, but that's your job, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> so you published Amsterdam and Atonement yeah. and on Chesil Beach and, mm -hmm. and Machines Like Me and um, all of that extraordinary uh, uh, career that Ian McEwen has had. Do you introduce your authors to each other? I mean, Margaret, have you met Ian McEwen oh, yeah. through Nan or you know, did this happen? I think it was through Nan, but of course, Nan was a connection. Um, Yes, no. Well, I, at those writers' conferences, you at writers' conferences at at um, literary um, things, which of course those kinds of festivals didn't exist until the mid seventies, right? At all, and even um, sending readers across the country to give presentations of this, this, this or that kind, um, that was that wasn't happening in the. 60s either it, got, it all got going in the 70s so uh, but you but you you have such a i mean you, you don't only do fiction and you also do um non you've done antonia fraser you've done tom cahill you've done uh, right across the board fiction and non-fiction and can you characterize for us um the difference or is it a different hat you put on a different chops that you need i don't think so i think that for all of the manuscripts that I have published, uh, first of all, it's the writer is a good writer. Secondly, uh, that he introduces or she introduces the characters so the reader can go along with the story right through the character. Um, and also that it's really about something that is serious and that will last. And those are the three things that are important to me. So it's really, so how would you, uh, for instance, tell us a little bit about working with Antonia Fraser. What is that like? Those incredible- Well, that is what one does. I mean, with Antonia, uh, she is published in London. So they prefer to use, you know, I don't usually edit her. I just publish her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and if I have a question, I will ask her about it, but it's up to her to do, you know, make a change or not. So that's a very different relationship from, say, Tom Cahill. Yes. And can you characterize the 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 the, the way that you work with him, for instance, on his? Well, I have the early part of the book that he will eventually that I'll eventually publish, um, but it's really. It's really, I mean, for instance, if there are, it, if you don't feel that you're going along with the author in the story, whether it, fiction or nonfiction, um, I say so to the to the writer. So I, say, you're not holding my attention. <laughs> right, it's not holding my attention. For whom I will jump up from the bed immediately and run do something else. <laughs> 
One thing that um, I think people will be curious about is how has the industry changed since the time that you started working together in what, uh, six, in the, the 60s, 60s, in the 60s, right. So how has, how has the process, the spirit, the character of the time changed in, an, in a publishing house for both of you? Well, one of the things which Peggy already mentioned is uh, author appearances. Um, the editor will also send the galley of the book to certain people if they want it, who seem appropriate to see if they uh, have a quote, which we didn't used to do. Uh, also, the reviewers, we are much closer to reviewers than we used to be. Um, but I think mainly it's, and it's even more so now, and it's going to be for the future, immediate future. It's much more, um, it was, publishing used to be, the center was the authors. Now the center is how many books sell and who is going to be a bestseller or not. And I've not necessarily, in fact, I mean, we talk about Peggy and uh, Ian. I mean, I never thought about being bestsellers. I just thought whether they were good books. And and indeed, that's how it turned out. How 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 um, so so the 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 times have have certainly changed. And has your professional relationship between the two of you changed in any way? In well, we got older, you know. It does have we got we got older. <laughs> but we got to older together. <laughs> yeah. So, so let's talk about different technology. So, when I started, I was using a manual typewriter, and I thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. When when electric typewriters got invented, and then I thought it was even better than that when you had these bouncing ball typewriters because you could you could take the ball off and put another ball on and make italics. How great was that? And uh, then I thought it was really extraordinary when they invented the fax machine because I could send pages to my typist because I needed to have a typist then because uh, I couldn't basically type uh, the way or I couldn't make a clean manuscript. I was too bad at it. And I would have to send pages to my typist and I could send them by a fax machine. How great was that? And then along came the personal computer. And at that point, you became expected to produce print-ready digital manuscripts. True. True. So you had to um, do, the, do a lot of editing on your thing. You could no longer um, type out the little, remember those little strips of white that you would type? Yeah, but you could take the change on it. Yeah. A little white brush with white out on it that you would then type on top of. You couldn't do that anymore. Uh, and remember letters. I've got some great letters from Nan. That got replaced by faxes and then by emails. Yeah, uh, now we do a lot of emailing. We do emailing. We do a certain amount of talking on the phone, but we always did talking on the phone. Um, so all of those changes. And, um, and that's the story of the industry, of how the industry has changed. Yeah, so and I think the... The sausage, uh, the line of sausages, because guess what, authors, you're not the only author. That has always been a great shock to me to realize that there are other authors. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> publishers will have a list, and it will be a spring list, and it will be a fall list. And um, I think the time between finishing a book and getting on the list has become longer. Is that right, Aunt Nan? Well, I think that is not true. Okay. It's usually nine months from beginning to end, and you forgot there's a summer season. There's yeah. spring, summer, and fall. We have to be able to put things out in six months. Yeah, I mean it really. But and we would, but we still do bound galleys and send them to people, uh, and send them to critics as well, so they can get a head start on everything. And um, but I think the main difference is the expectations from the corporations that buy us uh, of the amount of money we bring in. And the thing is, I mean, when Peggy and I started together, you were not a best-selling author, and now you are a best-selling author. It's a question of growing with the author. 
Right, right. Well, you've you've done that successfully, both of you together. It's a quite admirable and 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 such a long relationship. Uh, how important is the social whirl to um, to publishing? It's become more important for authors now that they're sent on tours and made to appear time and again and to have a platform, as they say. But how important is it? Well, there is a social whirl at Frankfurt. Remember Frankfurt? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> That's right, Frankfurt. Yeah. Uh, I remember once, particularly, <laughs> there was a book that I had under contract, and someone came to me and went to the agent who happened to be in Frankfurt at the time, and she said she was going to make an offer on the book, and I said, have you read it? No, haven't read it at all. But she was doing it completely on the reputation of the author, not out of any knowledge of the book. Uh oh I have to explain to the viewers that Frankfurt is a very famous book fair at which rights get traded and, and rights get sold before you even know there's a book uh, on the way or the public knows that there's a book on the way. But um, yeah. yeah. And that's particularly important in books that are translated from various, um, right. you know, from from French and German or what have you. Nan, what, what advice would you give to um, a young person? I think most people start as an editorial assistant. Right. And they read manuscripts as they come in and say to the editor whether this book or that book is worth reading and why it isn't so the editor can talk to the uh, agent, literary agent of that. But I think that it's the wonderful thing about being a, an assistant is you can practice anything you want. I mean, you can make suggestions if you want. Uh, you can say, you, I think the title is not so good. Um, they, and they're very good. I used, had a wonderful, wonderful assistant, Carolyn Williams, and she could really do anything. She's now an editor, but she, through working with me, you know, learned the process of the whole thing. And what's the secret sauce? What uh, what is it? What is it that um, th you think made you succeed uh, as you did, Nan? Well, I think it's just loving reading. I don't think there's anything magical about it. It's just loving to read it, read, and uh, then also identifying. I think it's true what people would be interested in as the um, Schindler's List. I mean, I thought it was a wonderful book, but I thought there really was an audience for it. Mm -hmm. And boy, were you right. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I want to thank both of you for helping us to understand um, the most important and certainly fundamental pillar of the publishing process, this whole editorial magic, right? The bond between the author and the editor. Much I, of it is much of it is so subjective and it's mysterious. It's uh, very subjective about whether you like uh, a book or not. I mean, another editor might like a book and it's published and it's too wonderful, but I might not like it. Right. So, I They're mean, chemistry. I think it's very important right. that both the editor and the writer think of the book in the same way. Don't you think that's true, Peggy? Yes, uh, I do, up to, up to a point. But I was going to ask you a question, which was this. Have you ever had a book that you absolutely loved, but you couldn't stand the writer? Good one. Uh, one doesn't come to mind immediately. <laughs> well, you don't have to say who it is. You don't have to identify. <laughs> Did that ever happen? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Enough said. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that must happen. I mean, really, it is. It is kind of a a, a chemistry, right? You have to you have to know yeah. whether you can work with that person or not. I'm it's sure other way around it, that you you I love mean, the writer, but you don't like the book. That can happen too. Right. Absolutely. I know <laughs> that's very difficult. But um, I'm fascinated by the fact that now with COVID-19 going on for so long and being so international that the book industry is doing very well because except for television 
And you can't go to the movies because movie theaters didn't let you in. Uh, so people have turned to the book and that's all to the good. Absolutely, all to the good. So um, thank you, Nan, for letting us have this glimpse into your um, editorial magic. I do think- Well, let me say one thing before <laughs> we go. It, you know, give the loyalty of authors is really marvelous. Yes. Yes, that's so important. And and I, I don't think, given your nature, you would tell us about all the hard knocks and the, and the sweat and that goes into the editorial process, all the work that, that it entails. A lot. But, but I just want to say the Library of Congress is really, really proud to tip its collective hat to Thank you. Thank you very much. Your lifetime achievements. It's really quite wonderful to have to, to see the long trajectory of what you've done. And I want to thank you, Margaret, for bringing us closer to the writer's perspective in all of this and the editorial experience. And your, your insights are so essential um, as an author to frame Nan's, uh, Nan's career and, the, and, and what it is actually that great editors do. So, and for all of you out there, thank you for joining us for Behind well, Thank you very much. And thank you for making this happen. And ha having us celebrate uh, together um, a great American editor, Nan Felice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.